Hi there, my name is David Batsoffin and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And at the moment, I'm doing a series called In Conversation With. And today, I'm in conversation with Dr. Lucy Kim, who is the project manager for the Mabula Ground Hornbill uh, Project. Uh, Dr. Kim, thank you so much for joining me. May I call you Lucy? Please do. Lucy, thanks once again. Um, the Southern Ground Hornbill Tell me about the bird, tell me about the project, and more importantly, why did you pick that? <laughs> Way to start, all right. Um, so southern ground hornbills are known colloquially as our thunderbird or rainbird. Um, they are not just ecologically important, they're top order predators, but they're also culturally important. Um, you will struggle to find anyone um, from southern Kenya down to Eastern Cape who doesn't have some sort of affinity with this bird. Um, they strongly associated with the coming of the first rains um, and people have just over millennia learned that good rains, good summers, good productivity is coming when we hear these birds calling. Um, so yeah, just enormous blackbirds, gorgeous long eyelashes, but they're in trouble. Um, and that's why our project exists. How long has the project been going for? So the project was started in 1999. Um, there was a British woman called Anne Turner who actually chose to retire to the African bush. And then when she got to Mabula in particular, where she, she'd bought a house to retire into, um, she realized hmm, none of these birds are around. She'd gone down to Mgeni River Bird Park and she'd met their show bird, Marilyn there, who by the <laughs> way is still alive and going strong. Uh, and Marilyn's a he. Um, but Marilyn just triggered something in her and she came back and she started asking why if we've got such good savannah here why are these birds not here um, and through that she got in touch with my dad who at that stage was doing all the early research in Kruger on ground hornbills um, and he had just started trialing whether we could harvest the second hatch chicks and use those in any way to restore the population and so the first reintroduction was done at Mabula in 2001. And how many birds were involved in that? So that was an initial three. Um, those were really early days where the rearing was still a bit iffy. Um, the birds were tame as tame can be, which obviously is not what you want for a successful mm. reintroduction. But it's been 20 years now of, of trial and error. Um, and we've got to a stage now where we have successful protocols and it's just a case of trying to expand it um, and make it actually worth something for the population and restoring the population. Are there progeny of those original three on the property still? They are. Um, and they are coming of age, so they soon will get girlfriends of their own um, and they will they will in turn lead their own groups. So what we what we figured out over the years is we need something called a bush school. Um, ground hornbills, you can rear them successfully. We know we know that now, you know, so that they're physically strong, mm -hmm. but actually they have to have all the right behavioral characteristics at the right time. Um, you know, much as a human child you know, yeah. goes through those developmental stages, we actually have to make sure that they're going through those same stages because because we found from the captive zoo population in the States that they actually are not successful breeders down the line if they don't get that right. And obviously there's no point in us reintroducing birds who down the line are not going to contribute to the population. So we have the system called bush schools where we add young birds to groups and when they've had four or five years of this wild experience under a wild mentor, they themselves are then moved to become mentors for new groups. So it's slow, but it works. I was about to ask, is it like elephants, um, matriarchal elephants teaching the rest of the herd where the water is and those type of things, but you've answered the question even before I asked it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, things like they, they kill venomous snakes and you can imagine a youngster, young human walking up to a black mamba or puff adder and trying to catch it successfully <laughs> without you know, succumbing. And, and it's exactly the same with them. They need to be taught where to roost uh, safely at night, how to kill venomous snakes without getting nabbed yourself. And yeah, just all of those bush skills that they need mm -hmm. to, in fact, be survivors themselves. But we're not going to find Dr. Kemp wandering through the savannah with with um, ground hornbills trailing behind her while she tries to catch venomous snakes or other sundry snacks to prove to them that it can be done. So actually that's how it was done, not quite to that extent, but in the very early days of the project we had human shepherds who would walk with the group and try and 
keep them safe. Mm. Um, but we realized soon that that wasn't working. You know, we could get them to adulthood, but they just were too tame. <laughs> and you know, so that's when we switched to having a wild experienced wild mentor. And when we, when we did, I've just published an analysis of the past 20 years of reintroductions. And one of the key factors that is a, one of the you know, variables that we need to succeed is that they've had that wild experience first. Now, you talk about venomous snakes, but I happen to know that one of your birds had a bit of a run-in with, um, with a porcupine not too, not too long ago. How did that happen and, and how did it resolve itself? So we, we don't know how it happens. Um, we do monitor these birds daily and for the team for two days had lost signal on her and we think she was on a neighboring property. Um, and we actually think she was ill with something beforehand because it's very unlikely porcupines and ground hornbills don't keep the same hours for a start. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, but she had one of those quills, she had three quills into her throat sac. Um, a, a, a truck full of contractors actually before we even found her apparently had found her and managed to remove one and then mm. she made such awful noises that they just released it <laughs> put it in fun you know and very kind so they didn't yeah. need to do that um and you know ground hornbills are not not scary big birds so you know hats off to them for trying um but yeah we eventually by the time we got it to honest to put we'd cut the remaining quills so that it didn't you know wiggle and do any further mm. damage but the x-rays showed it was straight through her trachea and wedged into the vertebra yeah it was wow. not cool and but she, has she survived. survived. She survived. Um, you know, we we work with an amazing team at Honest Report. Dr. Katya Kuppel has been the ground humble conservation vet for close on 12 years now. So, mm -hmm. you know, she's herself amassing experience, and in turn that feeds back into us getting more and more birds back from her alive. Um, yeah. And yeah, she was she was out of the system for three weeks um, and on an extensive course of antibiotics. And we decided because she's wild, better to put her back out with her group and just continue with the antibiotics. And that worked and she's fine. Oh, that's um, against wonderful. All but it's the first time we've ever had any indication of that. I must say this COVID time, we've had a number of freak incidents. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we got two reports of mortalities in KwaZulu Natal, one near Bulwa and one near Bergville. And in both cases, those were the alpha females of the groups that had been blown into a fence and died from trauma. So, you know, they're just, they're very able flyers, they're very flexible flyers. Um, they're incredibly socially aware because they're hunters, um, but it was uh, we, we went back and, and looked at the weather for those days when the pathologist said they would have died, and there were gusts of 36 kilometers per hour, and it was just, they just couldn't handle that and suddenly just smacked into fences, two separate parts of KZN, 100 kilometers apart within the same day. So yeah, we've had some freaky things going on <laughs> during this time. So do you then, although you're, you're based at uh, Mabula, uh, do you then monitor all the, the ground hornbill populations um, throughout South Africa? We we doing our best. So yes, we are. Um, it's quite hard to do census of them. You know, you can't go. It's not like a vultures where you can go to the breeding colony during the breeding yeah. season and count the number of pairs. Um, they're territorial and resident on their territories. So to to try and find who's alive on what territory is quite tricky. Um, so we rely heavily on citizen science. Um, and this year we've actually launched um, a national monitoring plan. And basically we're relying on citizen science uh, things like the South African Bird Atlas Project, apps like Bird Lassa, but then we've also got a number of WhatsApp groups, um, you know, to kind of reach the non-birding community, and mm -hmm. that is working an absolute treat, and actually that's how we heard about those two mortalities, because slowly we're getting these farming communities, um, mm -hmm. sugarcane farmers, timber farmers getting interested in the birds, and as a consequence we're getting a lot more than just the sightings fed back to us. Let's go back now to Lucy Kemp in Matric. What did she want to be? Um, she didn't know, so she took two years off <laughs> to think about it. Um, she is a child of a biologist, two biologists actually. Um, all of her school holidays were in Kruger studying ground hornbills. Um, so what she knew she definitely didn't want to do was this. Um, and I worked on fruit farms in the UK and in a pub. And then I went to University of Cape Town and studied zoology. Um, so I did have a look at the world and decided that actually 
the wild places were what made me really happy right. um, and trying to do something to keep them for other people to also have that happiness and peace and everything that it gives us. Um, I'm not a mad twitcher. Um, I don't need to rush out and see things, but really in my heart, I need to know they're there, even yeah. if I can't see them. And knowing that things are present and accounted for, um, I, to me is important. Um, so I then studied marine biology in a desperate effort to get as far away from ground as possible. <laughs> Then I worked in Namibia on high value plant species and black rhino, again, anything but birds. And now here I am. <laughs> so, so what, I don't. So, so then what brought you back to the, to the ground hornbills? I mean, all right, so you had black rhino and there's black in the ground hornbill. So there's a touch <laughs> there. But from, from marine biology to the middle of Mabula Game Reserve, there's no, there's yeah. no ocean near where you are currently. Or not that I'm aware mm -hmm. of anyway. No, there isn't. My surfboard is dusty. Um, <laughs> let's put it um, I, I, I was given the opportunity. They, they went through a bit of a management crunch and they, I, I was unemployed and living at home with my folks, which was never first prize for anyone concerned. Um, and um, I was just asked to be a stand-in manager um, just while they sorted things out. Mm -hmm. And then when I got here, I realized that my varied skill set which is varied, um, to put it mildly, um, would actually be useful. And I, I saw things that I knew I could put right. Um, and uh, yeah, ten, nearly 10 years later, I'm still here, still learning, still challenged. Um, and slowly we're starting to see the fruits of our labor. I've got a brilliant team. Um, you know, we've, we've just taken on a, a new position, a, a research coordinator, but the rest of my team has been with me for ages. And it's just, yeah, you know, it's, it's a committed, loyal team who just want to see more of these birds out there in the wild. Talk me through an average day in, you, in the Ground Hornbill project, if there is such a thing. Uh, there's no average. Um, my days are spent writing reports, um, sort of doing the data analysis and some of the paper writing and fundraising, to be honest. That's my, my primary role is to keep, <laughs> us, keep us paid, keep our buckies yeah. on the road. Um, so unfortunately, I've become quite desk bound. Um, but so there's constant monitoring of the reintroduced groups uh, in the breeding season. We're checking nests all around the country, um, putting up, making and putting up artificial nests. So it very much depends on what's needed. And then also responding to emergencies like the porcupine bird. Mm. Um, you know, that was a day off, uh, which was no longer <laughs> a day off when the, the frantic phone call came in. Yeah. Um, and then in between, we just work on awareness. Um, we've got a full time environmental educator in Tabi Singh Monama, who herself grew Grew up in rural areas and had no interest in conservation but met an environmental educator who just sparked something in her and that was her done and now she's doing the same and is sparking that spark um, in, in rural children across the country so it's wonderful. The, the thing about for me about ground hornbills is when you come across them because it's invariably when you least expect it you'll be driving down a road in Kruger or something and all of a sudden there is this bird just walking across the road like it owns it and sort of challenging yeah, they you. They, they do, <laughs> they, they do. And it was the same when I was in Mabula uh, on my last visit to Mabula, driving up um, to, your, to your project and all of a sudden come around a corner and there were like six birds in the middle of the road looking at you as if to say, I dare you. Ma make yeah. a comment, say something. <laughs> No, I mean, and that's, that's, I think, also the attitude that's keeping them alive, though. You mm. know, they, they've got such, all of their life history traits make them extremely extinction prone. And then you throw all of the human threats on top of that. Um, and to be honest, I do think that attitude is one of the few <laughs> things that's keeping them going. It also gets them into trouble, to be fair. Um, but they are characters second to none. Uh, you know, they, they look like dinosaurs when they run. Their behavior is so much more like primates than it is mm. birds. They're incredibly intelligent. Um, we had a French researcher out um, and she completed the cognitive uh, studies. You know, if you're trying to compare the intelligence of a chimpanzee to a dolphin to a ground hornbill, they all get put through the same tests. And, you know, they've come out, you know, top, top of, the, of the intelligent birds. Really? Um, they just don't know they're endangered. That's the problem. So ah. got to get them. Okay, so you've got to teach them to use email. That's the, that's the next or, trick. Or just be more careful in the environment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, no, you know, if they knew they were endangered, they might do more for themselves. Yeah. Lucy, you, you've alluded to the fact that, that they were tame, the birds that you had originally. Is this yes. self-taught? Do or are they normally an aggressive bird that keeps away from humans? Uh, so no, unfortunately, um, they are a bird that tames down really easily. Um, if you know Kruger, there's a number of what we call begging groups, which feel nothing for walking right up to vehicles, banging on shiny bumpers or whatever, and waiting for for junk food handouts, which is not good for them. I need to add. Yeah. Um, um, but they do just tame down and I mean we've got examples in, in the farmlands in KZN where you know the labourers have got a shed where they have a fire going where they have, make their lunch and sometimes the hornbills just come into the shade with them to join and, and use the shade so you know I think they've been part of our landscape um, you know as as people for so long. Their intelligence, um, they, they're also opportunists so you know they're obviously there for ha leftovers, handouts, um, they just yeah, I think, you know, I think we've co-evolved. I think they are, are a really important part of us in this landscape. Are they seen as a food source for humans? Are they seen as bushmeat? No, no they're not. Um, so we've had m many people, we've had very few reports of people who've actually eaten them. Um, most people say they smell bad, they taste bad. So, so that's not a problem um, at all. Um, we conduct these, what we call population and perception surveys across, across the entire um, range. And, you know, we're trying to extend that right up to Southern Kenya because the cultural beliefs of this bird are so localized. So, you know, at, even within the same language group, the belief structures can be slightly different. And those differences actually have really real and profound repercussions for the population. So um, an example that I can use for South Africa, generally speaking on Zulu speaking land, if you need um, to bring the rains in time of drought, a feather of a ground hornbill will suffice. And this is only in severe droughts and only specific members of the community can do this. Okay. Um, whereas we're finding so far, and, and I can stand to be corrected, our sample sizes are still quite low. Um, but in the Eastern Cape, there it seems to be more that you need the entire body of a bird. Um, and obviously that has very profound uh, population effects. Yeah. If you're taking out alpha, one of the experiences, experienced ones that should be the youngsters sure you know if you're taking out a juvenile it's much less of an impact on the population um so although the belief structure you know this bird will bring the rain is the same how that is then sort of brought out in in the actual process of it can have very differing impacts is it only alpha males and females that breed it is. So even if you see a group of up to nine birds, it's still just the breeding pair. And all of the other birds um, are generally males. They're not always the sons of that group, but very often they are. The, they will accept other males into their army. Um, and the, the army's job is to defend the territory and help feed the female. And then when the chick hatches, feed the chick. Um, and it does. It takes, it takes a community in their case to, to rear a youngster. Um, and, and one of the reasons is, you know, when they hatch, they're about that big um, mm -hmm. and they grow to full size within three months and so that's a hell of a lot of jumpy that's crawly awesome. things that you <laughs> catch um, and you know the poor the alpha male on his own would probably die of exhaustion trying to do that <laughs> so they need the whole group to help um, and also to defend you know if your neighbors want your nest but they're mm -hmm. eight and you're only five you know, there's a good risk you're going to lose your nest. And without a nest, which is not just critical for breeding, it's also the social center of that group. They come back to the nest, even in the non-breeding season, just to check on things, faff around. Um, it's a very important social place for them. Um, and so that's where the size of your army really counts. Did You mentioned uh, building nests. Do they take to human nests as readily as they take to their own? They take to, so, so they're really not fussy nesters, but what they do need is a safe uh, insulated hollow of about 40 to 50 centimeters across. And unfortunately in the landscape, we're losing those trees. Mm. Um, and so a lot of birds, even in the, the low felt system are nesting in really subpar nests. Um, nests that expose the youngster to the elements, uh, nests that are very easy for predators to get in. Um, and so, they, and they're nesting in these subpar nests because that's the best they have within that yeah. territory. Um, and so artificial nests have been tested and put up in the APNR. Um, and we know they take readily to those nests. Uh, what we did find, though, is 
originally we were using tree stumps um, and, and they rot after eight yeah. to 10 years and there's just no sustainability in that. Um, so working with the industrial design department at the um, Chani TUT, University of Technology. Technology yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, We've developed a nest that should now last 50 to 60 years, which is much more in keeping with the ground okay. humble's life. But it's, um, it's going to look like a tree stump. It's not going to be sort of bright orange like a traffic cone. No, it won't. Uh, it looks a bit like a dinosaur egg, to be fair. Uh, but, you know, with the pigment that we use, depending on the trees, we put them up and they do blend in, you know, they're very organic shapes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it may catch your eye driving past, but what we do try also is to put them beyond the reach of where, where tourists are, okay. are able to get sight of them. Um, and also it, it just, you know, slows the traffic around the nest because they, they spend about six months of the year faffing around the nest. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to put them at risk during that time. What predates on the bird and what would eat the egg? Um, so when mom is sitting on the nest, um, not a lot, um, maybe only a leopard would be brave enough to, to tackle that. Um, after the, the chick has hatched, um, after about a month, she then leaves the nest and joins the group. And then the chick's very vulnerable to leopards and baboons and things like that. Um, Janet maybe would take the eggs. Um, but we, yeah, definitely leopards are an issue. Um, but then once they... Once they've fledged from the nest, they really are naive, you know, needing all that teaching. Mm. And that's when they're susceptible to things like um, some of the aerial predators, crowned eagles, martial eagles, um, and then some of the ambush predators, cheetah, leopards, caracal. Um, so those, the big, the big hidey ones are the yeah. ones that out for um, and that kind of leads then into the habitat that they need they don't like bush encroached areas they don't like it if the grass layer grows too thick um, and that's something we found in northern Zululand before those private game reserves became game reserves they were cattle farms mm. and ground hornbills were found there in really good densities and good group sizes and that conversion from cattle to game meant that that grazing pressure just went through the roof and suddenly the hornbills it was no longer viable habitat for them but now that buffalo numbers are rising and that grazing pressure is back again we're starting to see the ground hornbills come back. Would a group then sort of emigrate for want of a better term to to lands that may be better suited or would they just sort of stick it out and adapt? They stick it out and adapt. The youngsters may go off and have a look around and find a place. But what we find is once the alpha pair have, have set their territory, mm. they will try and come back. And often, you know, often people, if they, they hornbills breaking windows or causing an issue, people always want us to take them away, move them. But the problem with that is wherever we release them, they will try and come back. And that often will take them through really dodgy areas and they're yeah. unlikely to make it. Um, so we try and look for mitigation on site rather than removing the birds. And now for 2020, <laughs> you've got you've got to laugh after you say the number, <laughs> um, because I don't know if this is a year, but anyway, the ground hornbill, the southern ground hornbill, is the bird of the year. Um, how did it that is. come about, and how does that make you feel? <laughs> so every year, BirdLife um, has a, a BirdLife South Africa has a Bird of the Year, um, and we've been pestering for a few years. And <laughs> we proposals, and it, it was accepted this year. Um, you know, we just find still, you know, people know them from Kruger, but aren't aware that they're really in trouble outside of Kruger. Um, and so this has brought us an incredible uh, awareness opportunity. BirdLife does an amazing job of getting the um, lesson plans and, and graphics and things out. And it's been a really fun partnership with them. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, I think, been really good for both of us. And the number of sightings coming in, people just interested in the species, wanting to know more. I think it's been great. I'm sad it's not a normal year because obviously it would have been a lot more useful um, yeah. if we could have used it to visit schools and, and do a lot more. Um, but still, we, we thrilled with it. But your project at Mabula doesn't have a, or why did I say doesn't? I don't know. Does it have a bird that you can take from school to school or do you only take um, material with you? Uh, yeah, no, we don't. Um, there are a couple of show birds in South Africa. Um, so at uh, Monte Cassino Bird Gardens and Mgeni River Bird Park. So you can see show birds there. Um, we have a giant suit. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
very cool and hot. Um, but the kids love it. It's called Tembo, which means hope. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's great because we, we try and get back to the same rural areas. And there are parts of KZN now where we drive into the rural areas and the kids immediately see our buckies and our logo and start shouting, Tembo, Tembo. <laughs> um, you know, so that, that, that mascot really has an appeal. Um, it's a nice way of showing behavior as well. Um, it's a good use of interns. Um, and um, yeah, the kids just love it and can really, you know, it's kind of cutie, cutesy and comic -y and mm -hmm. they can really relate to it. Um, so that's what we, we take when we, when we go out and do the schools. And visitors to Mabula Game Lodge, are they able to come out and see the work you're doing? Yep, so if they guess Soma Bulla, um, it's uh, once a week, there's a Hornbill Drive. Um, mm -hmm. All of the proceeds from that come to us, which we're, we're very grateful for. Um, and yeah, you know, our birds have radio telemetry, so usually we're able to find the birds. <laughs> yeah. being wild animals, there's absolutely no guarantees. No. Um, uh, and, and then also people get a chance to interact with the team, hear their stories, uh, see the nest with all its camera set up, see the aviaries that we use for reintroductions, and just get a feel for the project, for the species, for the threats, and hopefully people go away as ambassadors. That's really what we That's what you for. really want, and you want them to buy pins and merchandise so that they, they can spread <laughs> the word. That goes without saying. <laughs> yeah. the, the radio telemetry for me is always interesting for, for one reason. It, Whatever the animal is that has the telemetry, if it doesn't want to be found, it won't be. You can yeah. put a collar on a lion and you can have that blip as loud as you like. And it's happened to me before where we've been yeah. sitting within 100 meters of the animals and we could not find them. And then one of them flicked an ear and they were yeah. right in front of us. Yeah. But the telemetry didn't help us at all. No. Um, I helped on a snake tracking project in Dino King and we were down to the actual tuft of grass where the puff adder was supposed to be. And you don't really want to look any closer than that. <laughs> we were getting positive beef and I still couldn't see it. Gave me new respect for puff adders, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Did you find it eventually? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. like the click of a tail is what yeah. gives it away. Well, this is, this is always, they, they give yeah. themselves away at the end of the day. Um, yeah. What happens next year when they're no longer bird of the year? Will you, con well, hopefully things will be back to whatever the normal is in 2021 or 2022.0, yeah. whatever we're going to call next year. Um, yeah. Will you continue with your work in the schools? Will you continue with getting people more aware of what these birds are and how important they are to the environment? Absolutely. Uh, we definitely want to keep the momentum that we've gained from this up. But also COVID's forced us to, to rethink some things. So and Tabi Singh and I are also making little videos of, of ground hornbill activities that kids can do at home, little lesson plans. Um, and increasingly we're reaching out to radio stations. Um, you know, a lot of the local local rural radio stations, because mm -hmm. that's we've that is an excellent way in the time of COVID to get the message out. Yeah. Um, and, and the phone calls that come in afterwards with the questions are fascinating and also give us insight um, into how to do a better job coming up with really sound conservation plans to make sure we can actually make a difference for the species. So what are some of the questions that you've had that you've not been expecting? Um, a, a, a lot of people are quite scared of them. So a lot of people want to know um, if these birds are going to hurt them. Mm. Um, no, they're not. They will fly away. Um, they're smart. They want nothing to do with us filthy humans. Um, people, so that's a, a big worry. Um, and, but then also just asking what they can do when the when ground humbles break windows um, and interested in how the biology and the cultural uh, belief systems mesh. You know, so that's been a really interesting thing. And, and it really meshes quite beautifully. Um, and yeah, and then also just what we can, what can we do? And so through that, we're working to set up more of the WhatsApp groups because if someone's keen and they want to recruit all their friends in the area to report their sightings, that's fantastic. And slow, these little groups are slowly growing and gaining momentum. And yeah, people feel they're doing something for the species, you know, in their own mm. small way, which is fantastic. Lucy, I've been rather remiss because when we've been, we keep using the word um, hornbill. And I think people at home are going, oh, it's Zazu from the Lion King. We haven't described this bird at all. So no. let's do that, or not let, not me, you, 
describe the bird, how big it is, and no, it's not Zazu from the Lion King. No, so it's Zazu's very big cousin. Yeah. Um, there's there's two ground hornbill species um, in Africa. South of the Sahara is the southern ground hornbill. North is is the northern or Abyssinian ground hornbill, um, and they 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 the sort of the basal hornbill. They don't seal their nests like the, the other hornbills do. Um, they stand about a meter tall, black plumage, huge red uh, throat sac, and then this enormous dagger of a beak. Um, we, we think it's probably one of the strongest striking actions of any bird in the world. They've got fused vertebra up the back of their neck, um, which, which you know, protects all their brainy bits um, yeah. when they're trying to smash a black mamba's head to pieces or crack through a tortoise shell. Um, so they're big, powerful, beautiful birds, and they're just these enormous long eyelashes. I mean, any supermodel would die for natural lashes. In like both ma male and female have those lashes. Both male and female. They're actually modified feathers to keep the sun and the dust out of their eyes. Okay. Now, for yeah. people, now that they know what they're looking for, if people <laughs> want to get involved, if they want to contribute in any way, how do they find out more about your project? Um, have a look at our website, uh, www.ground-hornbill.org.za, and you'll find all our contact details on there. Um, and also just look us up on social media. Um, we're not good at tweets, or rather I'm not good at tweets. So Twitter, our Twitter following isn't great, um, but Instagram and Facebook, we're there, um, and we're usually updating some of our news every day, if not every other day. Um, we have a, a huge range of supporters and we would, you know, we really love them to know how we're spending the support, how they can connect to the species. So, yeah, we, we really try and keep those regularly updated. Great stuff. Uh, today I've been in conversation with Dr. Lucy Kemp from the Southern Ground Hornbill Project. Lucy, thank you so much for being my guest. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Really appreciate it.